Hello again. Hope everybody's healthy. We're going to read another chapter from Murder on the Kolel. Today it's chapter 13, Kaboom. Our next stop was Serenity Spa on the outskirts of East Lansing. It was a very, very upscale psychiatric clinic. Obviously, it had once been someone's private estate, and the main house had been converted into the treatment facility. The caretaker's cottage had been refurbished as the executive office of the complex, and this is where we met with the marketing director, public relations officer, spokesperson of the clinic, Mrs. Catherine Paisley. The 60-ish skinny lady was dressed in a tans blouse with a ruffled v-neck collar over brown tailored pants. Her gray blonde hair was in a neat bun at the back of her head, and her glasses were suspended over her scrawny bosom by a braided cord looped around her neck. Thank you for seeing us, Mrs. Pesley, I said in greeting. Please call me Kathy, she chimed in an aristocratic southern drawl. She had a broad smile across her face, but I could tell that it was as real as a $3 bill. What the old boys called a shit-kicking grin, like she knew something that you did not. I instinctively felt that this woman did not like me, but as yet could not fathom her reason for doing so. Normally people did not start disliking me until they knew me for a couple of hours. <clears throat> Why, thank you, Kathy, I said with an equally false smile. I noticed that I had reacted to her bad vibes and my tone had become just a little bit condescending. I made an effort to sound more sincere. How can I help you, she said, her voice dripping molasses. She wanted to help me about as much as she wanted a mule to kick her in the head. What a fake. But why? Why was she behaving so? <clears throat> Showing her my ID, I said, my name is Simon Lincoln and I'm a private investigator. This is my assistant, Daphna Lachler. Daphne, Kathy seemed surprised, but kept her vapid smile in place. We're working with the East Lansing police and looking into the death of Rabbi Avram Klein. We understand that he and his wife were here inquiring about hospitalization. Do you remember them? Of course I do, she said. Lovely couple. Liar, liar, pants on fire. She obviously did not think they were, they were a lovely couple. Can you tell me anything about the indication for hospitalization here? If you mean why here, then the answer is because we are the finest exclusive private clinic in this part of the state. But if you want to know the reason for the hospitalization, I'm afraid I can't tell you. Well, if it is a problem of doctor-patient confidentiality, well, the rabbi is dead and it does not apply, I said. Oh, I know that. I know all that, she said, tilting her head to the side very coyly. They made all sorts of inquiries into the facilities and care for schedule. They especially wanted to know if kosher food was available. She said this last with great disdain, as if Hannibal Lecter had asked for human flesh to be added to the spar menu. Is it, asked Stefna? Kathy was a bit perturbed by being interrupted. Of course it is. We don't serve kosher right now because none of our clients have requested it. Our catering service is second to none. No reason I can't tell you. The reason I can't tell you is because the clients kept on insisting that they were inquiring for a third party and would not tell me the diagnosis. <clears throat> I assured them that we could handle the full range of psychiatric illnesses, but they never got back to me. What a shame. Now I knew why, now I know why I was feeling this animosity from this lady. Good old Kathy was broadcasting her inner feelings through her body language and general speaking tone. She was a dyed in the wool, chitin eaten, southern aristocratic bigot. She was pleased as punch that the clients never called back because if they had, she would have had to come up with some reason for turning down their request. <clears throat> Good old Kathy was not the marketing director of the spa. She was not responsible to get more patients into the facility. Her job was to be the gatekeeper. She was responsible for keeping certain undesirable elements out of the spa. My guess is if you want to get into Serenity Spa, you had to be white, wealthy, and from the right side of the tracks. Alcohol and prescription drug abusers were tolerated, but gays and hard drug addicts were out. I was not gay, but I am sure that in Kathy's assessment, 
I had more than one disqualifier working against me. My yeshiva bachar outfit certainly did not help. What a smug old biddy. Did either of them seem to be more, I don't know, more concerned about the hospitalization, I inquired? I understand what you're getting at, she said. We get lots of people that ask our facilities for a, she held up her fingers like a quotation mark, third party. But I could say, I could not say if one of them was a candidate or not. I turned to Daphna and said, well, I guess that's it. Do you have any more questions? Yes, I do, Kathy, Daphna said, Daphna said with a sh shit kick and grin spread across her face. You know, I'm really impressed with what you folks ha do here. The brochure is so beautiful. Perhaps this would be the best place to move Dad. Dad looked to me and said with a sad, now you know his schizophrenia. I decided to play, oh yeah, his schizophrenia. Kathy nodded her head seriously. We handle schizophrenics all the time. Wonderful, said Daphna, nodding her head, imitating Kathy. Money is no object. He's loaded. All his life he put away a large chunk of his salary. Kathy suddenly became all smiles. Our client's financial situation is never a consideration for acceptance in Serenity Spa. Was her nose getting longer or what? Just one little thing, added Daphna. Uh, we, he keeps kosher. Uh, really kosher. As I said, we have caterers, said Kathy, her smile fading a bit. Good, good. And he'll need Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur prayer services. That should not be a problem, should it? Well, I don't know, stammered Kathy. We have a, we, we have a non-denominational prayer room. Oh, that'll be fine, declared Daphna. His friends from the meatpacking plant like to come by after they, cr after they cash their checks on Friday to drink beer and get drunk. That won't be a problem, will it? I'm afraid we cannot, began Mrs. Pesach. Well, I almost forgot and interjected Daphna. His black boyfriend likes to come and visit him occasionally. I assume your rooms are suitable for intimacy. Mrs. Paisley's whole orderly world was crumbling before her. I don't know about that, Daphna asked. Also, would it all be all right if we could have a Passover Seder in your non-denominational prayer room? Just 40 or 50 people, close friends, really, you know. I don't know if we'll be able to, said Kathy and shock. Are patients allowed to smoke grass, you know? Daphna stopped and gave the marketing manager a big conspiratory wink. For medicinal purposes? Are you referring to smoking marijuana here in Serenity Spa? Asked Mrs. Paisley, having difficulty in forming her words. Why, of course here. Dad loves a little pot every once in a while. He says it's good for his soul, said Daphna, waxing philosophic. I, 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 Kathy was at a loss for words. No need for an answer right now, said Daphna as she stood, pulling out a business card from her purse. Here's my number. You let me know as soon as things are arranged, and I'm sure that Dad will love it here. Daphna pulled my jacket and led me across the, towards the door. Remember, money is no object. <clears throat> at the threshold, I turned back. Thank you, you've been most helpful. Daphna added, when you get things arranged, give us a call. We'll move Dad in the very next day. Mrs. D Paisley sat dumbfounded at her desk. Why did you do that, I asked Daphna as we walked towards my car. Do what, she asked in mocking innocence. Well, make up that business about your dad. She nearly had a heart attack. The old hag was a big phony. Did you hear what she say in the finest, exclusive, private clinic? Asked Daphna, imitating Paisley in a commendable southern drawl. It made me sick, said Daphna in disgust. I laughed and said, not as sick as she looked when you suggested smoking pot at a Passover Seder in Serenity Spa. Yes, I enjoyed that. As we approached the car, Daphna bent over and said, what's this? There was a cord coming out from under my car and she grabbed at it. When she pulled the cord, I heard a sound that I had not heard for over 19 years. Luckily, a sound that I had not forgotten. 19 years earlier, I did my Marine Corps boot camp in the San Diego Marine Recruit Depot. That was the most physically and mentally challenging period of my life. It was living hell and Staff Sergeant Frank Pansky, my drill instructor, was my designated devil. His job was to take the 75 raw recruits of our platoon and at the end of 13 weeks turn out as many raw Marines as he could. Many fell by the wayside. I suppose he was no more vicious than any of the other drill instructors except in one special area of training. 
It was common knowledge that years before, he was held responsible for an incident in which a live grenade was accidentally dropped during grenade practice. Three recruits died and half a dozen were seriously injured. So Sergeant Pansky decided this was never going to happen ever again to any of his boys. To accomplish this, he always went around with three or four blue practice M67 grenades in his pockets. At any time, in any place, day or night, whenever he thought it appropriate, he would pull out a grenade, pull the pin, and then drop it on the floor. When we heard the sound of the spring mechanism pushing the spoon, that little lever at the side of the grenade, out of the grenade, casing, we knew we had four seconds to scream grenade and find cover. The practice grenade, grenades only went pfft and let out a small cloud of smoke. But if you're not at least 15 feet away, Sergeant Pansky would dress you down so that you felt like you were one inch tall. He would scream in your ear telling you that you are now dead and buried because you were too, too big a dunce to act quick enough. That your folks were now getting a telegram from the Department of Defense letting them know you were dead because you've been stupid and lazy. Then he would find appropriate punishment details. We got so we could recognize the sound of the spoon flying off the grenade in our sleep. Thank you, Sergeant Pansky. Because that was the sound I heard in front of Serenity Spine Lansing. I heard that spoon fly off the grenade and reflexively shouted, Grenade! Daphna was next to me and I pushed her down into a drainage ditch at the side of the gravel lot. She landed flat on her stomach and I fell right on top of her. Then we heard a loud explosion and the breeze rained down for about three or four seconds. In my brain, I just repeated over and over, thank you, Sergeant Pansky, so, so that after a while I was saying, thank you, Sergeant Thanksky. After the loud boom, my ears were ringing and there was an eerie silence. Maybe there was just no sound in the area or maybe my ears were not working yet. Eventually, I was able to hear the people coming out of the clinic yelling and screaming, curious about what had occurred. I got off the FNA and helped her to her feet. Are you all right? I asked. Nothing injured, as far as I can tell, she said. What happened? I assume it was an M67 offensive fragmentation grenade set as a booby trap under my car. A grenade? Your car? she asked. I, pounded, I pounded, pointed to my vehicle, what is left of my car. My GMC terrain was never going to hit the 2,000 mile mark. The engine compartment was now scattered in a 15-yard radius, and the body of the vehicle looked like Swiss cheese. If we had been in that car, we never would have survived. How did they booby trap it? How did they booby trap it, she asked. My guess, best guess that someone taped the grenade under the car and then put a loop of string on through the pin. They expected the string to snag on something as we drove, and then that would pull the pin. Without the pin, the spoon flies out, and activates a four second fuse. If we were driving, I never would have heard the spoon fly out. You knew that there was a live grenade under the car because you heard the spoon fly out, she asked incredulously. Well, yes, I suppose I did, I said, belittling the action. You saved my life, oh my God. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Don't thank me, thanks Sergeant Pansky. That's the end of chapter 13. Tomorrow we'll do chapter 14.